Well, as a bow hunter, this is a favorite time of the year. It's finally time to kick in and get out in the woods and hunt. And October presents incredible opportunity, but you have to manage October just like every other month. And there's some really good strategies in October that I think you need to apply no matter where you're hunting. And we'll talk about how those fit. You know, I grew up in Michigan, October 1st for the first 42 years of my life was a sacred day. And that was when you could officially start deer hunting. And I like small game. I love small game on the property. Small game in the presence of small game, whether it's pheasants, grouse, rabbits, it's always a great indication of quality whitetail habitat. Those are indicator species, but they're indicator species for my love, my true love, which is whitetail hunting. And, and uh, so when it gets into October, really special time. Let's just get right into it because I want to cover this pretty thoroughly. One of the big things you'll see each year is the best properties feature the highest percentage of uh, mature bucks in the area. So there's a lot of properties that unless a mature buck is just going through for the rut, he's not going to be on that property consistently in any way. In fact, a lot of times you see more of a barbell movement where bucks are here or over there. They spend about 15% of the time, 10% of the time in between. And... Other than that, they're somewhere else. So you're in that long stretch in between. You get an occasional pitcher, middle of the night, and you think there's hope when there's really not. So what are bucks looking for in October? Well, when the shift comes, that's when those bucks are shifting from their summer range to their fall range. I talk about that a lot. But they're really looking for specific habitat features and hunting pressure features that aren't prevalent in a lot of other areas. And that's where all of a sudden these bucks that were scattered, bachelor groups that might go from one property to the other are non-existent and they really narrow it down to one location. And number two here, October food is critical. It doesn't matter if you're on public land or private land, the food and the food choice of the deer herd sets the table and the structure of movement for everything they do in a 24 hour period. So there's a lot of great areas that have really good quote habitat. There's even people that just work on their habitat on private land and they'll say, well, we prune our apple trees, we plant native grass fields, we harvest the timber. But if you don't have that quality food source, none of that really matters as far as building a deer herd and a hunt. And so we're talking about two different things. Someone could have great habitat, even scientifically presented. We do this with this area because it's a waterway and we could create a pond. We do this with hardwoods. We do this with oaks. But that doesn't necessarily translate or it won't translate into a quality deer herd or a quality hunt unless you own the food in the area. And so when it comes to private land, you have to have those food plots. When it comes to public land, it doesn't matter if it's a remote apple orchard that used to be around an old homestead or a remote clear cut or just a drastic change of habitat from high versus low, from old timber versus young timber, swamp land where it meets that edge. Those are all areas where there's a lot of diversity in habitat, and that's where those deer will gravi gravitate to on public land. And if it's remote and you can get back there, especially if there's other people hunting closer to the road and you can get back in a remote location and let them push them towards you, then you're going to find that movement dictated by food. And a lot of times on giant public land tracks, the daily movement is dictated by what goes on on the outside of the public land tract. So it could be 50,000 acres. And I love hunting those areas because there can be large areas of private land that block off that public land, which is awesome because now you can find a backdoor entrance to come into that public land, set up a half mile away from those homes, those deer hunting properties, those golf courses, those neighborhoods, those farm fields where deer go to every single afternoon and after dark. And then you're setting up shop a half mile back in the public land, waiting for them to come back after a 45 minute walk in a lot of times difficult walk in to wait for those deer back to come back into your lap hour after daylight, two hours after daylight. It's an incredible tactic. I know Dylan, one of his spots in South Dakota, I, don't, I hope this wouldn't narrow it down too much, but he goes in by river, bunch of red cedar along the, the banks and get up into the bluffs. And I think it might get more hardwoods as it gets towards ag land. But then you have ag land at the top and you're waiting for those deer to come back into you and you're right in their bedroom. You're right in their wheelhouse. Absolutely. And, and that's, you're putting yourself in an area where Dylan is in the case like that, where they spend 90% of their daylight hours. So they might spend the last hour, half hour, or right at dark getting to those ag fields in the distance, neighborhoods, golf courses, private land with food plots, bait piles. But you're in an area, you locate yourself in an area 
where they want to spend 90% of their time, and that's all dictated by that food source. If there wasn't that outside food source on public land, those deer wouldn't be in that area of public land adjacent to there where you could go in and get a half mile back into the public land. No different than private land. If you don't have that quality consistent food source, and ag land isn't quality and consistent. It's very random. I love ag land because it pushes deer numbers up, holds more deer in the area in general, scatters deer herds. When it comes to October, all those food sources are changing. They've already started cutting corn around here. Pretty soon it'll be manured and then chisel plowed. The alfalfa, they have their last cutting. It's getting more stemmy and dormant. Pretty soon it'll frost sometime in October. That alfalfa's gone. The beans are harvested. They're turning brown already. So all those food sources that deer loved in the summertime are gone. And when you combine that number three with the quote October lull, what's the October lull? It's when the deer herd turns nocturnal because of your hunting pressure. Because if you have quality food sources that you found, they're going to continue to hit those food sources during the daylight hours unless you mess it up. And that's the problem with all of this. You start out in an area of a giant funnel of bucks all over the neighborhood. Dot, dot, dot. Bucks all over the place. As hunting pressure is applied, as food sources shrink, the number of locations where bucks inhabit during the day, especially the oldest bucks in the neighborhood, come down to a very small percentage. You have all these bucks going into that funnel and then they're going to be down in 3% of the properties in the area that actually hold mature bucks because those areas have food. They have adequate cover. It doesn't have to be the best cover. Going back to it doesn't matter what you do with your as much. It doesn't matter what you do with your timber, your fields, native grass plantings, if you don't have that quality food source. You have to have that first. Then you work on your habitats. First thing we did here in Minnesota when we came here, we worked on the food sources our edging for access, our stand locations, our mock scrapes. Then, winter number two, we start working on the bedding areas. We start adding water holes after that too because we wanted to establish that food source movement first. Once you have that structure down, whether you find it on public land or build it on private land, now you can build a herd if you don't overpressure it, and that's where the October law comes in. If you pressure the deer herd, the October law is created. It appears that they're just moving after dark. When they're not just moving after dark, they're moving during the daylight. You don't see them because they're somewhere else. You pushed them. They're into this 3% area right here. That's the October lull. Why does the October lull take first place in the first 10 days in a state like Michigan? Because the bow season opens on October 1st. So after everyone goes out and hunts those first few days, oh, it's October lull. It's because they sat on their food sources. They sat in the bedding areas. They sat all day in one spot, which was bad for the morning or afternoon because it was either a bedding area or food source. A lot of people go into the food source. They have this nice hunting blind out on a food source. They sneak in in the morning. They spook deer, whether they knew it or not. Well, those deer aren't coming back in the evening. Though. Hence the October lull. It can happen by the evening of October 1st on opening day. Unpressured line of movement. Critical. You need to find where deer are feeding here. They're bedding over here. And then that movement in between and that entire movement that encompasses the food and the bedding that's called a line of movement. You can find unpressured lines of movement anywhere a whitetail roams. And what's cool about that in October is again, the areas that have that unpressured line of movement, that have quality food, that have unpressured bedding, which is, it makes sense, unpressured bedding cover is more important even in low quality habitat than it is to have high quality pressured bedding cover or food. So they're always going to go to that path least resistance with unpressured areas. And so just because you have great habitat, quote, great habitat, if you pressure it in the deer's eyes, it doesn't matter how much money you spend or how much work you spend on that habitat. If it's pressured, it's bad habitat in their eyes. You might still have small game, but when it comes to deer herd, you need to be a little bit smarter. You can't just say, well, I'm going to spend money. I'm going to do this. I'm going to have the deer. You have to hunt it well. And that's the lowest hole in the bucket always is hunting. So when you find unpressured lines of movement, you know, I talk about that in big chunks of private land where you know there's exterior high quality food sources. It might even be someone's bait pile that has a private residence and five acres in the area or two acres. And they're just putting a bunch of bait out waiting for those deer to come in from public land. But the problem is on either side of them, it's all private land for three quarters of a mile to a mile in either direction down the road. So you have to come in way from the side and get in and get into that wheelhouse where the deer are spending 90% of the daylight hours and again, it all boils back down to food, and that's an unpressured line of movement. Maybe that person from that house or the neighbors, they don't go out into the public land. And I've seen that on so many different client properties. We go to client properties all the time that are private land, adjacent to public, 
And the consistent theme is no one hunts it because they just don't want to put the work and time in to go out around and wait for those deer to come back to you. So much unpressured public land out there to the point where it gets me a little riled up when I see online some so it's, I can only hunt public so all this is out the window. No, it's even more important on public land and you can find it. It just tells me you haven't done your work to find it. If you're telling me that there's that every public land around you is hunted hard, maybe you need to drive an hour instead of 10 minutes. Maybe you need to drive two hours instead of 20 minutes. The point is you'll find it and you can find it. There might be some very, very rare cases, but we're going out to hunt public land in Pennsylvania this year. Right on, I'll tell you, it's Allegheny Reservoir. I invite you to come out and hunt with me. But I can tell you there's not going to be a lot of people. We see an orange hat walk by average once a day. We're getting 45 minutes off the road an hour. I walk up some hills to get there. But I like hunting there because I can find unpressured lines of movement to go hunt. And what's really cool about October is if the food stays consistent and the unpressured bedding cover stays consistent, so you have this unpressured line of movement, then that entire movement lasts until the rut. So you can count on it until the pre-rut takes place. And the pre-rut's really cool because then those bucks that might be going to a specific spot, they go from bedding to food, bedding to food, field edges. Instead of going straight out to a food source, straight back to a bedding area, they start to run parallel to the field edge. So what was a perpendicular movement, meaning they're just going straight out, straight in, they run parallel and they start cruising those, those edges. They start expanding the range to go between bedding areas of doe, doe bedding areas instead of just straight from their bedding area to food. Their attention starts to turn on that doe herd. And that pre-rut in the end of October in most areas is awesome. Now, I go down to Southern Ohio, Kentucky, West Virginia, Virginia, Tennessee, that pre-rut, Kansas would take place more early November but in a lot of the upper Midwest it's you can kind of take the same advice you're just moving it back a week to 10 days but by the end of October here in southeast Minnesota southwest Wisconsin we're in the pre-rut and that means you start turning our attention not only from food but also bedding so a lot of my bedding stands my morning stands that's when I start to use for the first time towards the end of October Knowing that if I went in there early, those bucks probably aren't there. They're not moving side to side. They're not exploring those doe bedding areas. I'm just seeing does back there. So I spent a lot of time in the early part of October hunting afternoon food sources, making sure I don't spook out the bedding areas, making sure I can get in and out of those food sources or alongside those food sources or on the way to those food sources and not spook them. And then that flips towards the end of October. And if you're waiting until the end of October, a magical date of October 27th, whatever it is, Halloween, and you're waiting for that date to go in and hunt a bedding area, it's really gonna lead you in the wrong direction, just relying on the date. You have to be a little bit more strategic about it. And strategic meaning, if it's gonna be a high of 80 degrees, and it's 65 at night, 60 degrees at night, 58 degrees at night on October 27th, wait till October 29th when the temperature's dropped, it's gonna be a high of 57. It's 29 degrees in the morning when you go out that's when you can count on pre-rut activity. It's not that the weather is pushing does to come into heat. It's pushing bucks to make more movement and more activity during daylight hours than after dark. A lot of times not even expanding how much they move during a 24 hour period, just shifting it so it's during the daylight and maybe going to side to side a little bit more. And that's when you start shifting your focus from afternoon food sources to also considering morning areas. And that's where I shoot 70% of my bucks a year during that morning time, pre-rut. And I wanna get them in the pre-rut because those bucks still haven't gotten in the middle of the rut where it's hard to find a doe and they start really ranging out. And that's more rut strategy. But pre-rut are for the bucks that are here now, call them core bucks, that are you're seeing consistently during daylight. You get back in there in the morning, they'll move more during morning hours. And then there's those non-core bucks you have to wait towards the middle of the rut. But if you have a great property, you have one of these properties where you're towards the bottom, bottom of the funnel of lack of pressure, great food, great cover, then you're going to have some core bucks on your property and you can't miss the pre-rut for hunting. Don't say, well, November 7th is a great time to hunt. Yeah, it might be smack dab in the middle of the rut. But if you need to rely on that time to hunt and shoot your big bucks, you've probably done something wrong you with scouting on public land or building it on your own private land because some of the best hunting takes place the end of October, first seven to 10 days when you get down a little further south of November. But don't miss the pre-rut. And keep in mind, all this right here, when you have those unpressured line of movements, 
they keep getting better because more people are hunting, they're pushing bucks, food sources are dwindling, bedding areas become pressured no matter how great the habitat and very few properties, if you've done it right, even on public land, you found a little honey hole of line of movement, it'll keep getting better as October moves on. And I know there's a lot of tips for October and talking about that, but really look for unpressured food, unpressured cover, line of movements, public or private land, and you can expect that to hold all the way through towards the end of October, and then you run smack dab in the pre-rut, and if you've allowed that line of movement to continue unpressured, you're gonna have a great hunt in October. And yeah, the strategy changes a little bit when we get into full-blown rut in November, and then after post-rut is really tough because they focus purely on food. We'll talk about that next month. But really the name of the game all hunting season long is minimizing your pressure, finding those food sources the moment on public land or the food sources you create on private land that last the entire season. You have adjacent adequate cover to support daylight movement during the day. And you'll have a great hunt, not only in October, but all season long. Now, I appreciate you guys watching the YouTube channel, but I don't know if everyone knows everything that we have to offer, whether it's on whitetailhabitatsolutions.com, our website, or WHS Wildlife Blends, our seed company. Also, Instagram you can check out. I'm very active on Instagram, putting strategies on there, photos of what we do every day. Uh, much more active there than Facebook. But our seed, web classes, books, clients, Articles, I have over 600 articles on whitetailhabitatsolutions.com, everything whitetail strategy. Of course, we have hats on there, and then make sure to check us out on Instagram again. But lots of stuff to offer. We're always coming out with new things, and this isn't the end of it. We have more things coming soon. Make sure to check us out.